Sorry, everyone. I, I'll, I'll get started. <coughs> the next in our series in the Emerging Science of Culture. So today, you get to hear from some of the organizers of the talk series. Myself, Steve Hyman, and Arno and Zion. And uh, the project I'm going to be talking about today actually began in 2006 when I arrived at UBC. And R and Steve and I just began talking. And we kind of came into it with uh, a couple of suspicions and a question. And as we began to talk, we each had different areas of expertise. And we began to realize that there might be a real issue or a problem here as we sort of shared our different areas of expertise. So the first suspicion is that the experimental database in behavioral sciences. So when I say behavioral sciences, I mean sort of uh, psychology and the experimental wings of economics and political science, sociology, and cognitive science. But that's really drawn on a very narrow database. A narrow portion represents the sample in these experimental sciences. Um, and that the next point is that behavioral scientists frequently assume ge generality in the research, that they readily generalize from these narrow samples to hu humans at large, to the species. And uh, the next question is, both of these might be true, and still it's a good assumption, that, that you can uh, sample narrowly and generalize it, and it's still okay. So that's really what mostly I'm going to be talking about, is whether you can make that generalization. And this brings me to the question what we really know about, about human psychology and behavior. Okay, so um, this led to, to several papers. So, uh, so we're actually going to be drawing on this in different ways in different places throughout the talk. So the first uh, paper there in Behavioral and Brain Sciences is a target article that kind of lays out most of the case I'll be presenting to you to today. And then there's 28 open peer commentaries. So in some of the discussion, we'll draw on some of those, some of those frequently asked questions or some, what we felt some of the most important concerns about our argument. Uh, then we also wrote a, a rather long reply, so a 12,000 word reply, which we'll I'll draw on a little bit. And then finally, we, we did a sort of essentially an advertising uh, in nature, which sort of tells you to go read this other paper. Okay, so um, these are the three the three issues: is our suspicions about the database is the database too narrow, and then if it is too narrow, do researchers generalize well beyond their samples? And then finally, is this generalizing the state? And so if you have to leave early, I can give you the first two answers right there. So <laughs> very quickly go through those. And then finally, for the last one, this is really what we'll be, we'll be spending our time on, is it really turned out to be even worse than we suspected in terms of whether you can generalize. OK, so conveniently, it took a really long time to write this paper. And uh, we started in 2006. So around 2008, a psychologist named Arnett published a, an analysis of the top, um, the top journals in six sub-disciplines of psychology. And this actually, we were sort of going in the direction of doing this analysis to find out well, what actually are the samples, so what are the facts in terms of that. So this was very useful. Uh, so 68% of subjects in psychological studies in these top journals came from the US, 96% came from the West, and 70% were undergraduate samples. So already then you can see it's kind of narrow. Uh, we were able to make this calculation to the chance of a, a randomly chosen American undergraduate appearing in a psychology study compared to a, a, a every, all the other non-Westerners in the world, it's 4,000 to 1. So there's a high over-representative would be the, would be the argument. Okay, so we came to sort of eventually converge on this label, which we began to label the database as WEIRD. And WEIRD stands for... So Western... <laughs> It's really much cooler of the animation. <laughs> Educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So you'll just hear me using the word weird a lot. It just means it's our, our term of reference for the sample, that the way in which this, the, the database of the experimental science is biased. OK, so the next question is, we can move quickly. It's only, it's only, we only have an hour. Uh, so is do researchers assume their findings are, are universal? So is, is one human or, human or at least human group pretty much as good as the next. And we feel this is done both implicitly and explicitly in different disciplines. So the first thing we did is we pulled a bunch of psychology textbooks to check those. And the psychology textbooks are tricky because they'll typically have a chapter talking about the, the, the details of generalizing and methods and external validity. And then you'll go to the rest of the book and they'll say people have these biases. And if you actually track down, well, who are the people? Oftentimes they turn out to be mostly American <coughs> um, So there's a kind of disconnect in places in psychology textbooks. And uh, you know, there's very little discussion of sort of characterizing these findings in terms of how much can we generalize these. Although psychologists are more cagey than the other disciplines. So uh, these are all non-psychologists, political scientists, and 
economists and anthropologists are authors in this paper. That's economists, singers are economists. So, um, famous paper published in 2002, Altruistic Punishment in Humans. Zurich undergraduates were humans. <laughs> <laughs> Egalitarian motives. These are published in Nature, so the top journal in the world. Uh, Davis undergraduates are the humans there. And Homo recipicans. This is a bit of a review in which Bowles and Gintas argue that you know, we need to replace Homo economicus with another species specific uh, creature, uh, Homo recipicans. And this is actually draws on a wide range of experiments, but all done with Western undergraduates. So just generally, just by going through the sort of top journals in the world, science and nature, you don't have to leave those. You can find this, these generalizations being made. And also you might say, well, maybe it's cheap. You know, it's in the title, but probably if you read the paper, they're probably very careful. Not very careful. Uh, you can, there's no footnote saying, well, we can't, there's nothing like that. Okay, um, so these are our first two questions. They seem to come, at, they come out as checks. Then the next question is, well, these could both be true and it's still not a problem. So that's where we're really going to focus on here. Um, now, in, in developing our review, we, we had to limit ourselves in certain ways. So we, we did a big review of the available cross-cultural multi-population experimental studies. We wanted studies that had more than two populations where we could actually do a uh, three or more comparison. Um, we wanted constructs or proxies which were assumed to be universal, at least by the authors and preferably by, by lots of people. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't worry about things like differences in values, which, which people who study that take to be variable in the first place. So that's, we also didn't do a uh, draw on clinical psychology or, or clinical problems, uh, cultural. Uh, yeah. So we, the data is scattered. So the first thing we're doing is we're really making a prima facie case as to sort of what do we know. Because it's scattered, it's in all different areas, um, not all the same societies are compared in each case. So you'll see what I mean as we go. But we found we could organize the data into four telescoping contrasts. Um, I want to emphasize before I tell you these contrasts that this is just a rhetorical division of the data based on its sort of scattered nature. So the first thing we could do is we could make a contrast between studies done with industrialized populations and non-industrialized populations. And then we're able to compare Westerners and non-Westerners. And then we're able to compare Americans with the rest of the West. And then university educated Americans with, with other Americans. <coughs> and in each case, the outliers turn out to be the industrialized societies, the Westerners, the Americans, and then the university educated Americans. And now, also in our paper, we spend time detailing the variability studies, but then we also itemize things where there seems to be good uniformity. And there are cases of that. Um, they'll pass by briefly. Okay, so the summary of the key results. So the first thing is that there is substantial variability in what are taken to be universal constructs, universal aspects of human psychology or cognition. Um, these occur in, in what at least to some would be seemingly basic or fundamental domains of psychology. So I'll give you an example of visual processing in a few minutes. Now, the other thing we found, and this is, per, well, it's also very important, is that Westerners and, uh, well, Americans, Westerners, and undergraduates from industrialized societies are frequent outliers. So it's not just we find variation across societies, but that the populations that are most frequently sampled that dominate the database are actually often at the end of the distribution. They're outliers, or at least they anchor the tail end of the distribution. So you, the initial reaction to the first one, you could say, well, maybe there's cultural variation, but at least we're probably getting somewhere in the middle on average. But our, our, we don't think that that's what the current available data says. OK, so this is a little bit about organization. So the rest of the talk's going to be organized according to these different areas. Um, I'll do the industrialized versus non-industrialized. And then Steve will take this middle portion. Um, I also threw this in. We'll also give you a brief comparison of modern Americans versus Americans from 50 or 100 years ago. Turns out that modern Americans are more weird than Americans <laughs> 50 or 100 years ago. And then finally, R, is, R will take us through the uh, discussion and implications, how, how to fix the problem, how to address it. Okay. Now, one thing to say, probably a lot of people are familiar with the psychological literature, you know that this isn't a new worry, that lots of previous psychologists have raised this alarm. Um, we really feel our contribution here is not novel in, in noticing that the, the database is biased, but in that there's been enough new data coming in the line, we're able to dig up and organize enough previous data that ours is the empirical contribution. These other ones were focused on noticing that the database was heavily slanted towards uh, Western undergraduates. Our contribution is <coughs> let's lay all the data out and see what kind of a picture we get once we have all the data. 
So we're hoping that uh, being more empirically minded will be, be harder to remember. Okay, so a couple of clarifications before I press on about what we're not arguing in ways that one could misinterpret our argument. Um, the first is that there, uh, we're not arguing that there's no psychological universals or that there's no reliably developing cognitive problems. Ours is, is a methodological concern about how we go about figuring out what those are and what's the right way to make, to make that argument. The second is we're not arguing, surely, that evolutionary approaches are inappropriate for humans. In fact, we think we have a contrary vision, which is that there should be a broad-based interdisciplinary behavioral science that's seated within an evolutionary framework, but that tackles cultural variation as part of the stuff that tackles interpopulation variation. Um, and also, throughout this review, we'll highlight that, in fact, the evolutionary researchers have been some of the most responsive in doing car uh, comparative work in different populations. And then finally, we don't want to argue that American undergraduates should never be studied. Um, clearly, the convenience of the North American or Western undergraduate uh, is, is unparalleled. So it's <coughs> sensible to, to start there and, and just question how you generalize and how you proceed from it. Okay, I'm going to start with what I call the parable of the foot. Um, anybody who's familiar with anthropology will know about this. Uh, so I get different stories. Uh, one story is that Mary Leakey discovered the Latoli footprints in 1976, but certainly by 78 and 79, there had been this 27.5 meter long trail of ancient hominid footprints in Tanzania. Uh, now, so a volcano had laid a, a, a soft layer of ash that the three hominids wandered through, uh, two big ones and a, and a small one. Um, and um, these footprints were a great find for paleoanthropologists because uh, there's this chance to get a look at human bi or hominid bipedal bipedality. And those footprints had some interesting patterns. So the first was that the big toe was pushed off from the second toe. And there was an, an anterior fan into the foot, so the foot was spread out, and a substantial arch. And in comparison to these done with, with footprints of, of weird people, uh, suggested that these were maybe primitive bipeds, that they hadn't fully developed bipedality. But then a decade later, Mike Bosch and, and Russell Tuttle uh, teamed up, and Bosch went to a group called the Machu Gang in the Peruvian Amazon. And he did the same kind of studies of the footprints. And when you, you compare Machiganga footprints <coughs> to these, these uh, hominids, you find that uh, there's no difference. That you can't tell that Machiganga have a toe that kind of sticks out, a, a wide foot, and a substantial arch. And the detailed studies since then suggest that uh, growing up with, with hard soled shoes like we do causes our feet to be deformed, essentially. Uh, we get flat feet where our toe doesn't stick out because we don't need to grab the ground and we don't get a splaying. That's, uh, uh, adaptation to, to growing up barefoot. Um, so the, the point of this is that you should you can't even generalize about human foot anatomy by, by studying weird people. So you should worry about generalizing about other things. The same also now appears to be true for running profiles. So if you learn to run by wearing soft, cushiony shoes, you run different than uh, than the matching All right. So um, so there's our parable of foot. I'm going to talk briefly about visual illusions and then perceptions of fair, so contrasting industrialized societies with work done in small-scale societies. Also in the paper, we provide detailed discussions of both biological reasoning, how people think about plants and animals, and uh, spatial reasoning, which would seem at least to some to be a basic cognitive process. This is a famous illusion, so if you've had an introductory class in psychology, you might be familiar with this illusion. It's the Muller liar illusion. Uh, what it's supposed to capture is when you have the inward pointing arrowheads, this, this, this line, the red line, is going to look shorter than, than this red line here with the outward pointing arrowheads, even though they're the same length. And you can get a measure of how strong this illusion is, basically by showing people a series of these lines and manipulating the length of the lines until they don't perceive a difference. So that A looks the same length as B. Um, a will have to be longer than B for people to perceive it that way, at least people in this room. And, uh, so then you can get a measurement of how strong the illusion is. This has been a con canonical example of cognitive in impenetrability. Because even once you know that fact and you've measured the lines, you still can't unsee it. You still see them as, as different lengths. So this would seem like something at least some would think, well, that's a piece of vision, right? That's hardwired, that's built in. But when you actually do this, and this research was done actually in the 60s, when you actually do the cross-cultural research, here we have the undergraduates in Evanston, Illinois. And this is the strength of the illusion. So this is the percent that the shorter line, or the one line, the inward arrowhead line, has to be longer than the other line before they're perceived as equal. So this is Evanston, and this is um, South African Europeans in Johannesburg. Uh, 
going to be the strength of illusion drops from about a fifth longer until they're equal to 15% um, longer. And then it goes all the way down. Now, if, 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 if you're a son, these are um, foragers that live in the Kalahari Desert. Then the lines look the same length to you. You actually perceive the world how it is, so there's no illusion. So you go from no illusion amongst the kinds of societies that humans evolved in to the largest magnitude effect in our kinds of societies. And you get the same thing in children. So those are children ages 5 to 11. These are mostly African groups. This group's in the Philippines, and this group is Australian Aboriginals. Okay. Um, now, why would this be? Well, the, the, the main hypothesis that the authors present, which I think is still defensible, although there may be something having to do with perspectival art as well, is that we live in a world with carpenter corners. So all throughout our world, we see 90 degree angles. And this makes sense if you think about that our visual system is going to ontogenetically adapt to the kinds of assumptions it has to make as it's moving through the world. So when light actually hits your retina, and it creates a 2D image. And then your brain has to do some calculations and turn that back into a 3D image by making certain, certain assumptions in its calculations. So in, in making those assumptions, it seems that our brains, having grown up in a world with all these carpentered corners, are ready to see those corners in the same way that this dawn would see with those long to form 90 degree angles. So, so unlike the, in the natural world, like where the, where the cone live, there are they probably never see a 90 degree angle. Uh, but there's lots of Mars. So most people throughout history until recently, so I don't what you mean by recently, but certainly even though it's very long enough so I can say that, um, did not have to deal with uh, carpentry points. So this is a peculiarity of a particular cultural evolutionary trajectory. Okay, a little bit um, drawing on some of my own, own research, uh, doing comparison trying to measure fairness in our societies. So we've done a number of different experiments on two different projects, but I'll just tell you the simplest one. It's called the Dictator Game. And we take a sum of money equal to a day's wage in the local economy, and we give it to a player, and they have a chance to give as much of that money to another player, another member of their community they don't know and won't see again. And this kind of provides us a baseline measure of what, what local level <coughs> fairness, at least in this kind of context. So it's going to remain anonymous, and there's a straightforward sort of game theoretic prediction. If you're selfish, uh, if, you, if you're rational and self-interested, you should give zero in this game. So that's kind of a baseline. Now, we've done this project twice now, and we've done it in a range of different small-scale societies, selecting different small-scale societies each time and intermixing them with some of the same ones. Um, so there are hunter-gatherers like the Hadza in Tanzania. There's the pastoralists like the Samburu. There's wage workers in Accra. Um, horticulturalists and foragers in New Guinea. Uh, chieftains and horticulturalists in Yasawa. Uh, students at Emory, and uh, townspeople, non-students in rural Missouri. Now, I'm only going to show you one thing, but we've done three experiments just on the second project, and it gives you five different measures, and you can tell the same story of each of the measures. Okay, this is just the basic uh, bar graph, shows all the different societies, and over there is the offer. So that's the amount of the total amount of money, so say it's $100, that the first player chose to give to the second player. So if you give given 50%, you're, you're splitting it evenly. And you can see here on the, on the anchoring one end of the distribution are the Americans, so a small town in rural Missouri. It turns out you can do it in urban Missouri, you get the same result. You can do it in suburban Detroit, you get the same result. You can do it in a meat packing plant outside of Kansas City, the same result. You can do it in Zurich, same result. Um, so anyway, that's, that's a robust result among non-students. And then you go, as you go to different societies, you can get all the way down to societies like the Hatsip, or Foragers, or Chimane larger horticulturalists in the Bolivian Amazon who live in single family units, and you find that they give much less. Now, nobody goes near the game theoretic prediction, so we can say that that's wrong everywhere. Um, but there's, there's quite a bit of variation. And I showed you that, that Bowles and Gintas um, uh, piece earlier where they were assuming homo recipients. So initially, both evolutionary theorists and economists assumed that this was the, the human universal result. Um, but it turns out the people who actually live in societies like our ancestors are, are quite different from, from the folks in the group. So you can show the same thing with um, uh, the ultimatum game and other games, different measures. It turns out you can explain a lot of that variation between those groups using two things. One, the degree of market integration in the society, participation in the market, and the measure of world religion. 
Uh, actually, with those two measures, you can capture the, all the intergroup variation. You can't get anywhere near all the inter-individual variation. But, um, so the idea here that, that we put forward is not relevant for, particularly relevant for this talk, but just that people adapt and internalize local norms for dealing with things like market economies that you don't get if you do the same game in different ways. Uh, I said that. And this, this, you can replicate this result. We did it twice. We, we did a different methodology. We replicate at the local level, at the group level. OK. Um, now, I wanted to just briefly mention some of the other domains which, which don't seem to vary. Uh, and so, um, so some other visual illusions, the, web, the Americans are somewhere in the middle, so this horizontal vertical illusion. Basic color perceptions, all societies seem to perceive <coughs> color. Recognition of basic emotional expressions, um, which is evidence that that seems to be reliably developed in different societies. Uh, evidence for theory of mind, although it seems to develop at different ages and different places, it does seem to appear everywhere. And some notion of psychological essentialism seems to appear everywhere. Now, there's lots of other two population studies, but we put those aside because we want to be able to compare at least three or more, so sufficiently large. large What button are you pushing? This one. Button there. Go back. And I'll turn it over to Steve. What? Yeah. 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 All right. There you are. Um, so I'm going to be summarizing the rest of the data from our uh, four contrasts, so the remaining three contrasts. And um, the data is somewhat of a, of a laundry list here because we really are surveying like all the different findings in the behavioral sciences that we could obtain that were done with multiple cultures. And um, so this contrast then is contrasting Western versus non-Western um, societies. And these are domains in which uh, the Western societies then occupy this extreme end of, of the distribution. Um, so uh, one of these here is uh, more analytic reasoning. And I'm going to elaborate on that in, in just a minute, what, what that means and how they're different. Um, more independent self-concepts in the West. And what an independent self-concept means is that people are basing their identity largely on these individual attributes, these self-contained uh, psychological attributes, that people understand themselves in terms of um, their personality traits, their, their attitudes, uh, their values. And it's been the model of the self that most social psychological research has been grounded in, a model of the self that's um, considerably more common in Western societies uh, than in non-Western societies. Um, more motivations for self-enhancement in the West, and a motivation for self-enhancement is this uh, desire to view oneself positively, to uh, construe one's situation so that one is looking good. Um, and, we, and we see uh, more evidence of this in uh, Western societies and around the world, um, and especially low evidence of this in East Asian societies. So there's considerable uh, variation in the strength of, of this motivation. Um, there's less conformity in, in the West than in the non-West. And, and conformity has been a popular topic of study in social psychology. I think social psychologists treat it as if it's surprising that people are conforming. Um, they do these studies, and, it's, and the dependent measures are, look, people are conforming. Uh, they shouldn't be conforming. Conforming would be irrational. Um, but yet, there's still quite a bit of conformity going on. Um, but there's even more conformity going on uh, in the rest of the world. And perhaps conformity uh, wouldn't be seen as such a curious topic for study in the rest of the world, where it is uh, more common and, uh, and more accepted. Uh, a more desire for choice in, uh, in Western societies, uh, people prefer more choices. And, uh, and there's more of a, um, a discourse on the positive aspects of choice. And a choice is a, a core component of uh, economic theories. And uh, I'm going to summarize one of the other contrasts, just how much uh, some weird populations really desire choice compared, compared to others. Uh, another um, point here that Westerners have more of a morality uh, based on justice concerns. And this seems to be a universal moral concern, a justice concern. That is, uh, people view things as wrong that harm others or are unfair. And this seems to be a universal concern. You see it everywhere. Uh, however, what's uh, unique here to Westerners is that they don't elaborate much on other kinds of moral concerns, such as a moral concern about one's interpersonal obligations towards others, or uh, a moral concern towards purity, uh, or what is sacred and that those are moral concerns that are elaborated in addition to justice concerns uh, in many other uh, non-Western uh, populations. And then uh, there's less anti-social punishment uh, in Western societies, and I'll elaborate on that right now. Oh, 
actually have a look at this slide. There's uh, also um, many, many two-country studies, actually. This is probably the norm in cross-cultural research, is to compare a Western sample versus a non-Western sample in some phenomenon, and you find differences. So there's hundreds of these studies. Um, but uh, we don't include these because it's not clear uh, which one is, uh, when you do just a two-culture comparison, which side is the more unusual side. If you want to say what is an outlier, it's, it's not clear if you need more samples. But uh, so antisocial punishment, where uh, Westerners seem to um, be held by it. Um, so uh, uh, Fair and Gunther here uh, conducted a public goods game back in 2000 with uh, Swiss uh, students trying to um, look at the conditions under which uh, norms for cooperation could, could catch on. And so they had this uh, economic game in which uh, people played as a group and they could contribute their own real money to a pool and if they did contribute that money to a pool, then the experimenter was going to multiply the money in the pool by 1.6 and distribute equally among uh, the four partners. <coughs> so uh, if everyone put in all of their money here, uh, you would profit because it would be multiplied by, by 1.6. However, of course, there's going to be the temptation to uh, defect here because the best situation would be that everyone else puts their money in, you get a portion of that uh, times 1.6, and you would keep all of your own money in and not put, put it in. So there's this temptation to, to free ride, and people do that. They free ride a lot. Um, so they, they added this uh, variable here where um, they allowed people the opportunity to punish the other players. So they could take their own money, take a dollar of your own money um, to punish someone, which would cause them to lose three dollars. And people often would do this. They would pay their own money just for the pure satisfaction of seeing someone else have their money taken away from them because you don't like the way that they're playing the game. And uh, people often would, would do this kind of punishment. And so when there wasn't this punishment variable in there, there was a lot of free riding going on. People just weren't contributing. There wasn't very much cooperation. Um, and then when they added this in conditions where they had the punishment uh, variable allowed, then uh, we saw some stable cooperation. People started to um, cooperate more. There's less defections going on. And so they concluded then that cooperation this over, over large groups here was possible because people had these uh, innate motivations for altruistic punishment. Because people want to punish those who aren't contributing to the group, that's what uh, enabled uh, cooperation to take off as a norm. Um, and so that was done with uh, uh, Swiss undergrads, and then uh, more recently, um, Herman et al. conducted the same studies uh, in 14 countries and uh, found this pattern of data here. So on the left here, these green bars represent the degree of altruistic punishment. That's the extent that people are punishing those who aren't cooperating. And this actually does seem to be quite universal. There's not a whole lot of variability here across these countries in the, in the amount that people want to punish those who are cooperating. Curiously, though, there was a considerable variation um, and much more pronounced in these non-Western societies outside of uh, the Western ones where the studies are originally done in some anti-social punishment. That is, people who are paying money to punish those who were cooperating. Okay? And the idea that other people are cooperating their money, and someone here is saying, I'm going to pay some money to punish that guy. Um, and it's kind of a curious finding here, perhaps punishing the, the sucker, the sucker who's going along and maintaining the system. Um, and uh, it's something that wasn't really considered in just the Western samples because it was, it was a small effect and it doesn't really make uh, a whole lot of uh, sense, perhaps, to, to Westerners. Um, but it was a much more common tendency um, in these non-Western societies, common enough that it completely eliminated the benefit of the altruistic punishment. Okay, so um, this antisocial punishment here is something that uh, Western researchers would ignore if they only study uh, Western samples, but it's actually uh, quite common and seems to undermine uh, the development of the norms in the other places. Um, so another variable here that uh, Westerners stand out on is uh, this distinction between analytic and holistic thinking. Uh, Westerners are especially analytic. And uh, analytic thinking has been uh, viewed for some time as, as a dominant uh, reasoning style. There's been, been a lot of uh, attention here at how people uh, uh, form categories, how people break <coughs> things down into their component parts. Here, uh, logical reasoning. Um, and uh, so there's been a great deal of research in this. And then um, several years back, um, uh, Dick Nisbet and, and his colleagues, like Mike Farah here, uh, did some research. 
and in uh, Dickens' book in 2003, um, indicates that this analytic thinking is, is much less evident uh, in East Asia. And the argument um, has been offered here was that there are these habits of thought that have persisted across centuries. And you could see the seeds of analytic thinking in classical Greece, where you started seeing uh, evidence for, for this kind of um, uh, analytic thinking um, that continues to exist to this day in the West. And that in Confucian thought, you saw evidence more for this holistic thinking, a way of reasoning by similarity, a way of reasoning how um, things get, uh, are connected to others by their relationships. And, um, and this was the, the claim uh, that was made uh, a few years ago. However, even since this time, recent as it is, um, the evidence is suggesting that uh, it's not something peculiar to East Asia, this holistic thinking. Um, that actually this holistic thinking seems to be uh, the dominant way of thinking around uh, the non-Western world, that outside of the West and almost everywhere you look, you find evidence for holistic thinking rather than analytic thinking. It, doesn't, it most likely didn't emerge um, in the rice paddies in China uh, as was originally thought here. It seems that holistic thinking um, may, may have been the, the, uh, well, the default way of thinking of early, early humans, and analytic thinking uh, came later. And just, there's many different measures of this analytic holistic thinking. Here's this one variable that, uh, with the same measure that there are multiple observations here. Um, this here is if you subtract the amount of holistic judgments from analytic judgments, uh, European Americans here are largely analytic. Um, these three groups are all from Turkey. Um, I have herders versus fishermen versus farmers and more analytic thinking going on by the herders. Uh, than by those engaging more cooperative uh, endeavors, efficient in the farmers. And then uh, Asian Americans uh, showing slightly more holistic than analytic thinking, and East Asians in East Asia here uh, showing even more holistic rather than analytic thinking. And just point out that this is a case here where we have a, a reversal of the, the tendency here that a different reasoning style is dominant in these two cultures. It's not just that one effect is weaker than the other, but we actually see a, a, a reversal. And, in many of the instances that we have um, of these different uh, uh, findings that we reviewed, there are cases of these kind of reversals. Okay. Um, but weird people aren't weird with everything. Here's uh, the, do the domains which we found that there weren't uh, reliable differences between Western and non-Western populations. So uh, sex differences in a variety of aspects of, of mate preferences, whether um, men preferred physical physically attractive women, whether uh, women preferred ambitious men, uh, male preference for a uh, ideal uh, waist-hip ratio. There wasn't a clear difference between Western and non-Western population uh, for those. Um, the structure of personality, that personality seems to boil down to a five-factor structure of extroversion, openness to experience, conscientiousness, agreeableness, and one that I'm forgetting is neuroticism. Um, and uh, that structure seems to hold uh, pretty much everywhere it's been studied. Um, and sex differences in violence, um, men are far more violent than women. Um, and the degree to which that's true doesn't vary much across, across society between the West and the non-West. Okay. So some ways that there are similarities between these populations. Um, so the next contrast then is comparing uh, Americans uh, versus uh, other Westerners. How do Americans compare with other Westerners? This is the contrast where we have the least amount of data available. Um, I think a lot of um, people have the intuition that there, there wouldn't be cultural differences between these groups, and people actually don't have done many studies comparing them. Um, but there are a, a few data points here that we extracted where uh, we could make uh, draw conclusions. Um, Americans show more defensive reaction to thoughts of death. I'll elaborate on that in a minute. Uh, compared with other Westerners, Americans show yet even more independent views of self. Again, if you think of this as a, a self-concept by which most psychological, social psychological theories have been developed, um, and this is a, a self-concept that's even uh, more extreme among Americans than among Westerners, which is an outlier compared with the rest of the world. Uh, analytic reasoning, Westerners are more analytic than non-Westerners, and Americans are even more analytic than other Western groups, other European groups. Americans show more of a tendency uh, to think of these analytic ways of uh, seeing things as uh, fundamentally separate from, from other, other things. And Americans, compared to uh, other uh, Western groups, show more desire for choice. Um, here's uh, talk about that last point here, how Americans prefer uh, choice more than other, um, other groups. 
So, um, yeah, so several studies have been uh, conducting uh, cross cultural comparisons of how people view choice between American and non Western countries. There's a lot of research on this. Um, quite interestingly, showing here that uh, not only do uh, Americans prefer to have many choices compared to other groups, but they see more of their actions as being choices. What um, some of the res recent research by Krishna Savani here finds that uh, what Americans call a choice, Indians just call a behavior. And they say they just do things, or Americans choose to do things. The exact same task that they do, the exact same behaviors, Americans take an ownership on it in a way that um, Indians don't. Um, so comparing Americans with other Westerners, there aren't very many studies, but the few that exist, Americans seem to occupy the tail end of that. So just here's one, uh, just a, a, another simple example here. Imagine you go to an ice cream parlor, would you prefer to go to one where you've got to choose from 10 ice cream flavors or 50 ice cream flavors? And this is the percent here that prefers having 50 flavors, U.S. versus uh, these five uh, Western European countries. And the Americans are the only one where a majority of them want to choose from more flavors. That 10 flavors isn't enough uh, to, to get it right. Okay? Um, and there's some other variables like this here where uh, Americans want more choices. Uh, more is, is better when it comes to choice. Um, so Americans show more of a tendency to have these defensive responses to thoughts of death. And this is something that comes from uh, terror management theory, the theory out there that shows that uh, people seem to desire kind of symbolic immortality. They, they don't want to admit that they could die, that this is all going to come to an end. And so when thoughts about death uh, come to mind, when you think about the fact that, oh yeah, one day I am going to die, um, that people show a variety of defensive responses so in terror management theory, this is a way <coughs> can, people try to align themselves with their cultures more. With the idea that their cultures are going to continue to exist even after they die. And this way they can get the, the immortality of their cultures. <coughs> and so um, there's been hundreds of studies in terror management theory now. And a uh, very consistent pattern of finding that, findings that if you remind people, uh, actually I can say people here, uh, about death, they are more likely to show uh, these kind of worldview defense responses. Um, so by R showed that they're more likely to endorse uh, supernatural beliefs, uh, they become more patriotic, uh, they're more eager to protect the status quo, uh, punish those who break the rules, and they dislike outgroup members more. Okay, and we sort of saw this play out in, the, uh, in real life perhaps after 9-11, when death, arguably death was on people's mind and we saw more of this uh, going on. Um, and terror management theory has been studied now in something like 20-something countries around the world. And you do get a universal pattern of response that there are defensive responses everywhere. This is a case here where uh, the effect is largely the same across cultures. It just varies in terms of its magnitude. And it's the strongest effect you get for Americans. A little uh, more, more defensive than other Westerners and more defensive than, um, than non-Westerners. Uh, and this is kind of curious because death would seem to be a, a universal problem, right? But, um, uh, and while everyone is responding to it, uh, but Americans are responding the most. Um, no one's really explained this yet. Uh, I think it might have something to do with the extreme individualism in the U.S. makes one more existentially vulnerable here. That uh, if all I've got is wrapped up in me, then me dying, me <coughs> ceasing to exist is a, is a bigger problem. Um, so uh, Americans versus other Westerners, domains which Americans do not occupy an extreme position. Um, the only evidence we can find is <coughs> the previous two contrasts, industrialized versus non-industrialized, Western versus non-Western. We can't find any where uh, Americans and Westerners um, uh, look the same, other than those two contrasts. Uh, so the, our fourth contrast, fourth and last here, is to compare college-educated Americans. These are the, the sample of choice in uh, behavioral science research um, versus other Americans. And so uh, domains in which college-educated Americans differ from other Americans, um, they yield higher heritability estimates of IQ, and I'll unpackage that in a minute. Um, so Westerners are more analytic than non-Westerners. Americans are more analytic than Westerners. And college-educated Americans are more analytic yet. Okay. Uh, likewise, with the independent views of self, this keeps getting telescoping, and um, we find that the college-educated Americans are the most independent of all. Um, college-educated Americans are also less conforming than non-college-educated Americans, um, and uh, they they show more of a desire for choice. Um, 
I'll talk about that in a minute too. And uh, they show more of a justice-based morality that um, non-college educated Americans actually do show uh, some moral reasoning based on concerns with interpersonal obligation and uh, purity. Um, whereas college educated Americans uh, exclusively seem to focus on harm and fairness as a concern for uh, uh, moral, moral reasoning. And, yeah, and, and college educated uh, Americans show even more defensive responses to death thoughts than non-college educated. So um, first, the, the heritability of, of IQ. Um, so typical estimates of the heritability of, of IQ is that um, the genes account for more than 50% of the variance in people's IQ. Um, and other two components here, shared, shared environments and non-shared environments contribute just a negligible amount. So that uh, IQ, uh, the majority of it comes from uh, what you're born with, is what um, these behavioral genetic studies uh, show. And these behavioral genetic studies are typically done with two, two main ways. One is uh, comparing siblings. How similar are siblings who are adopted versus siblings who are blood-related? Um, the idea being that blood-related siblings share half of their genes on average, and adopted siblings share uh, very, very few uh, genes. Uh, and also, um, comparisons of twins, fraternal versus identical twins. Identical twins share 100% of their genes, fraternal twins share 50%. So if you look at within a family here, how similar are people's IQ, you find that identical twins are more similar in their IQ than fraternal twins. That's one reason why we get these kinds of estimates. Um, uh, but it's worth noting here that uh, these studies here don't sample a population randomly here. First of all, it's very hard to adopt a child if you're not of mid to high SES, uh, socioeconomic status here. Um, so uh, the vast majority of uh, studies that included adopted siblings are high socioeconomic status um, studies. And twin studies, it's, it's less obvious that uh, twin studies should be biased uh, in this way because twins are born regardless of socioeconomic status. Although the likelihood that twins participate in a study uh, is uh, biased towards those of the college education. Um, and I think in general, when you're advertising for studies, uh, often the, the, the idea of people who are interested in participating in a study for their own interests are going to be often biased towards those um, uh, with a college education. And uh, it's possible that heritability estimates of IQ might look quite different in, in other environments, <laughs> given that this is a, a, a narrow pattern of environments. And this is, there's three different papers that find the same finding here. This is one by uh, Eric Turkheimer and colleagues. If you look at the proportion of the variance of people's IQ based on uh, the genotype, based on the shared environment, the things that they share in common uh, with their family members' the environment they share in common, and here are the environments they sh that they differ with their family members. And if you look at uh, um, socioeconomic status here, those at the high end, which are typically what's sampled here, you get a very high estimate for the genotype among the high end, and a very low estimate for contributions of shared um, and non-shared uh, environments. Um, however, if you look at uh, the data that's available for uh, those who are from the poorer segments of the population, you get considerably lower estimates of contributions of the genotype, and higher estimates of contributions of both shared and non-shared environments. And there seems to be two, well, two hypotheses to account for this. One is just in calculating um, percent uh, variance explained by the genotype, you're dividing uh, the, um, a numerator into a, a denominator here. And by uh, having a broader range of socioeconomic environments, so you're having a, broad, a larger denominator. So this is going to be a smaller fraction of it. So that's one possible account. A second account that's uh, offered is that there might be a threshold effect here, that um, you uh, um, a certain amount of a stimulating environment is necessary to fully develop one's intellectual capacities, and that there's very little variability in that amount of environment among high SES people, and almost everyone in a high SES household live in a house where there's books, and they're encouraged to, to read, um, and uh, they uh, well, uh, have access, full access to uh, stimulating uh, parts of the environment, but there's much more variability uh, in the lower end. There's some poor houses with lots of access to books and valuing education, some that don't. Um, so these are the, the two accounts that have been offered uh, uh, to make sense of this. Um, and I would like to point out, too, that one kind of environmental variability that's always lacking in these behavioral genetic studies 
is cultural variance because uh, these studies are always done uh, looking at families who share a cultural background. There aren't studies, and it would be very hard to find people, where one sibling lives in one cultural context and the other sibling lives in the other cultural context. So that's this one big portion of variance that doesn't enter into the equations here. But so anyways, you get, uh, here's where uh, a biased sample can lead to very different conclusions in some perhaps unpredicted ways. You wouldn't necessarily think that um, depending on which uh, slice of the population that you study, that you're going to get different estimates of the role that genes play in something like IQ. Um, so desires for choice vary across um, college-educated and non-college-educated Americans. College-educated Americans value more. Uh, so I just want to describe one study that, that uh, demonstrates this nicely. This is a study that was done in a mall, and uh, people came into the mall to fill out a, a questionnaire. And at the end of the, the study, they were um, offered a pen that they could take with them. Uh, that was the compensation for filling out the questionnaire. Some of the people had a college education, and uh, some had a high school education. Um, so the experiment showed this array of pens, and the subject would, would choose one. And then in uh, one condition, the free choice condition, just as it was explained to them, the participant keeps their chosen pen. This other condition called the usurp pen condition. After the subject chose their pen, the experimenter then said, oh no, my mistake, that's my last one, you can't have that one. Take it back from them and give them another pen. And the other pen that they gave them was the one that was chosen by the previous participants so that on average they were matched in their overall desirability. So they weren't lousy pens that they were getting, they were getting one of roughly equal, equal value. Uh, and then people were asked at the end, well, how much did you like your pen? How, how desirable was your pen? And so for the high school educated participants, uh, it didn't matter whether um, they got to keep the pen they got or the, uh, the pen they, they chose was usurped. They still, um, for the most part, liked these roughly to the same degree. That wasn't a reliable difference. But for the university educated, they didn't like having their pen taken away from them. I chose that pen, this other pen, and you're not giving it to me. This, this is now an inferior pen that I'm stuck with here, showing how uh, choice here is really valued and, and uh, celebrated in uh, college educated families. Um, so domains in which uh, there aren't differences between college educated and other Americans, the best we could find here is this second order meta-analysis. That means this is a meta-analysis of meta-analyses uh, of 7,000 studies. So just a huge number of studies. And, and what the take home message from this second order meta-analysis is about half of the phenomena there was a difference between these uh, student and non-student samples, and about half there wasn't. But there wasn't a clear pattern. You couldn't really say, predict beforehand which ones are going to show a difference and which ones don't. But about half of the things, there was no difference between college students and non-college student samples. Okay, so to, to summarize these findings then, um, so there are many instances of universality, um, but there also exist many cases of uh, pronounced culture vari variability. And importantly, these cases here are s some of the most studied phenomena in, in the literature. Like they're not these uh, exceptions, things that uh, we the field has been ignoring. They've been many phenomena that that, that uh, sub disciplines have been built upon. Okay. Um, and many of these phenomena that vary across cultures uh, could be viewed as as fundamental, as, as basic. And this is one thing that um, you know we find puzzling with this uh, with with our findings here. Um, what many of the commentators uh, to our article suggested, and we sh and share this intuition, that some things are fundamental, those fundamental things are going to be the more, uh, the more universal things are going to be the more basic things. And that the less universal things are going to be the sort of higher order things that are, you know, you say tomato, I say tomato, but still we're talking about the same, the same fruit. At the surface, it might, culture might matter, but deep down, it, it won't. Um, but looking at the phenomena that we studied, we didn't find that kind of pattern here. It was, uh, you know, we, like the Miller Lyer illusion, that's, you know, this basic perceptual phenomenon here. You know, the uh, extent of that the genome, uh, or at least, um, well, that heritability of IQ, uh, these motivations for fairness, um, and motivations for, uh, for morality, the way you reason. Um, to us, it's, it's, uh, it's not clear from here uh, that those phenomena that we found the weird people to be outliers are any less fundamental than the phenomena which they look universal. 
And uh, I think many of the com commentators were trying, and what we think we'd like to try, I mean, this invitation that you could uh, uh, perhaps try to come up with some a priori set of standards or ways of expecting what phenomena should be more universal than others. Because it would definitely be um, handy if you knew beforehand that I don't even have to study that across cultures because that's a universal phenomenon. I've demonstrated it once, it's going to look the same everywhere. Um, we don't think that we're in a position yet to offer those guidelines here and that we really need to, at this point, just gather data and see which things are universal and which aren't, and hopefully some framework can be uh, discovered from that. And uh, so again, summarize here, many key domains, uh, data from weird samples are outliers, and, and in these domains, the weird samples would seem to be among the worst samples that you could choose uh, if you're going to generalize to the species. And uh, <laughs> uh, let's pass it over to Thanks, Steve. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to, to be quick here, just to wrap things up and uh, talk about some some uh, implications. Uh, <coughs> by the way, uh, I think in terms of the team here who did this work, I'm I'm the least weird on this group. I, <laughs> I I'm from. Uh, is this the light here? Here's, doesn't work. So I'm from here, from Lebanon, tiny little country. Some of this weird, I think Steve is the second least weird because he's Canadian. <laughs> and Joe, of course, is the racist. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a problem here, as, as, uh, as by now you can see. Uh, we have 90% uh, of the world's population that is, that is not represented in, in uh, most of psychological research. and. Uh, the ones that I represented seem to be quite unusual. So, um, oh, well, that's the. End. So, so this raises a number of interesting and important questions for a variety of research projects that psychologists, econo economists, primatologists, uh, and other behavioral scientists uh, deal with. So, so I'm going to go uh, quickly mention a few of them, and. Uh, raise some important issues that the weird, weird uh, people problem um, uh, causes for them. So one is cross-species comparisons. So a very big flourishing area of research is to look at, in terms of the phylogenetic origins of various kinds of psychological structures, uh, uh, researchers try to look at uh, what is common among, say, humans and chimpanzees, or, uh, or a variety of other uh, uh, related primates. And the typical research design would be you compare uh, it, it, some chimpanzee subjects with human subjects, with people. Of course, the people are, by now you know, it's weird people. So, um, so if we sampled a different uh, group from, from a different human population, we might uh, come to very different conclusions. And there are some examples of this already. So, for example, um, a, a research group from Leipzig uh, recently published some papers showing that um, if you look at, if you compare chimpanzees to uh, uh, Dutch or Germans, you find, in, in spatial reasoning, you find that chimpanzees uh, use uh, allocentric kind of spatial reasoning, um, uh, which, which takes into account cardinal location, uh, north, south, east, west, whereas Germans and Dutch use the relative or egocentric spatial reasoning, left, right. Uh, so you might, from that, you might, you might infer that actually we have very different kinds of, uh, our, our spatial reasoning styles are different. But then if you would sample virtually any other non-Western society uh, outside of the West, uh, the further away you get from weird populations, the more allocentric they get, in which case they are more similar. Right? So depending on which uh, human group you're comparing to other primates, you get to, into different conclusions. Another uh, important project that is uh, very influential in the behavioral sciences is, is the study of the origins of human psychology in young children. In fact, now there are studies even in infants. And this is, of course, another important way of addressing this problem, although it's not a solution. It's only a partial solution. And the reason for that is, of course, we find a lot of evidence that uh, cultural influences can, go, uh, can start very, very early. Um, so in the muller lyer illusions graph that Joe showed, for example, we saw that actually you get the muller lyer variability even in very young children. So this is a helpful project. It's important. It's part of the puzzle, piece of the puzzle. But it's not going to be a remedy to the general problem. 
Now, just very quickly, I, I also want to mention this is something that came up in the in the commentary and discussions. Also, is that are we saying that uh, studying with samples is always bad or always unproductive? That's not what we're saying. There are some cases. Uh, several we thought of several examples and others thought of it as well where actually it is quite a reasonable strategy to use with samples so one of them would be for example to test existential claims so if, if you have a theory that, that says that such and such way of thinking or such and such way of behaving exists in human populations it's an exi existential claim that has never been demonstrated before then you can demonstrate in any sample or any population you don't need to go um, uh, to a particular um, non weird population. So that would be in, uh, one <coughs> case where um, you, one could start with grid samples. However, even in those cases, uh, once we demonstrate an existential um, uh, claim, we want to go beyond it and then try to look at uh, universality of variability. An example would be, for example, the influential work of uh, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, where they showed that uh, people actually systematically deviate from the predictions of rational actor models in economics. So they, most of their work was on with populations. But that's still a very important influential work because they show that the theory doesn't work in a, in a sample of people. Uh, once you demonstrate that, however, we want to go beyond those samples and then look at the extent of the, the issue and the extent of the problem. Another important uh, issue that came up that, uh, uh, that I'm going to talk a little bit about is the, is the question, are weird people really outliers? So some commentators pointed out that they said, yes, you're right, that uh, there's a problem here. We're, we're relying on a thin slice of humanity that, uh, that um, might bias our results. But uh, they disputed our argument that the, the samples that, we're, that they're overrepresented in the behavioral sciences are outliers. And their argument went as follows. They said, well, it's kind of weird, it's strange that the first group that behavioral scientists hit upon to study turned out to be a massive outlier. Right? In terms of probabilities, that's very unusual. Why would that happen? Uh, our response to that, to that critique is that actually it's not a random process that, that uh, behavioral scientists hit upon the people that, that they're familiar with to study. In fact, the, the very traits that make uh, uh, weird people, people weird or, and weird researchers weird are the same traits that they make them curious about studying uh, human uh, behavior in this particular way, science, and also uh, the kinds of resources that they have to do this kind of project, which is very expensive. So, I, so there's a huge self-selection here that weird researchers are biased towards studying weird people <coughs> given their, their peculiarities. So it's, it's not a random process. Another important issue that comes up often is uh, if this is all true, then how can we go about establishing human universals? And as Joe started in his talk earlier, we all of us think that there are human universals, and it's an important project to understand what, is, what are these common features of humanity. The problem is how do we discover? How do we get to these universals? Um, and and uh, the answer would be to broaden our samples and look at the full diversity of human, human uh, populations and then look for universal and, look, and then look for variability. And to do that, I think one important uh, thing we need to deal with is the question of what is a universal? How do you get to find a universal? And a few years back, Steve Heine and I actually tried to deal with this, with, this, um, with this question and we thought that actually, oftentimes we just think about universals as like an all of non phenomenon. Either it's universal or not universal and that's not really how it, it, it does, if we think about it, it doesn't really make sense that, that that's how it should be. So, and the, the data you showed today, uh, that you, you saw today, uh, shows actually a variety of kinds of universals or levels uh, in, a high, in a hierarchical sense. So, for example, uh, so we, we, we came up with this model that could be helpful in guiding research to look for universals, although this doesn't tell you really, uh, it doesn't answer the question of guidelines for telling us a priori what is universal and what isn't. As Steve said, we have to collect data to, to answer that question. But this can help us look for possible universals. So at the very bottom of the graph, what you can see is what we call accessibility universals. And these are the kinds of universals where it's exactly the same process or tendency or bias. And it's exactly in the same amount that, that can be seen in different cultures. Okay. So that this is the strongest kind of universal one can think of. And mo most behavioral scientists, I think, believe that this is how things are. Where, in fact, in fact, this is a probably a small percentage of cases, as far as we can see. 
A second uh, level of universal that is, is somewhat weaker would be a, what we call a functional universal, where there could be differences in the amount or effect size or the, the, how strong the, the, the tendency is, although the direction of the effect is the same. So an example would be the, uh, the, the, the figure that uh, Steve showed that shows that uh, people become more uh, defensive, culturally defensive, in response to thoughts of death. And uh, you could see that the, the, the tendency is the same everywhere, it's just that it's stronger in the American population. So that would be an example of a functional universal. And there are, there are existential universal. This is a, even a weaker kind of universal. And this is the kind of universal where we might find a tendency or a process exists in, in everywhere, although it may not be used in the same way and to the same degree. So there could be latent... Uh, uh, so, so in the same exact situation, people from different cultures may respond to the same situation in very different ways, even though they might have a latent response that they might, they could respond in a similar way if you, if you ask them to, for example, but they might, might not to because of different habits of, habits of thinking. So those are existential universals. And finally, uh, there could be non-universals, where there, are, there could be many psychological tendencies that are culturally scaffolded, where you need certain kinds of cultural institutions, cultural practices to even to get any to this, this particular kind of psychological process. And a good example is actually counting, counting beyond three, which now evidence shows in cultures that don't have any counting systems, uh, in cultures where people have uh, words for one, two, and then many, if you ask them to count beyond three, they just have very difficulty doing it, even though they have no problem estimating quantity, for example. Okay, so, so the, the red line here indicates basically the assumption in the behavioral sciences, and then uh, I think the model shows that there's much more than that that we should be able to account for. All right, um, so I, I want to uh, start wrapping up and uh, talk about a couple of things. One is the, what is an, I think is an important uh, caveat that's uh, often called, well, Medin and Dr. Medin and his colleagues call it the home field disadvantage. I think which is a really important issue to consider as an implication of, this, of the real problem in the behavioral sciences. And this, the structure of the problem is as follows. We have a situation where uh, researchers are overly relying on a, on a sample that is familiar to them, right? Turns out that this, this sample, or this case study, is an outlier. This could lead to a number, a number of uh, big problems in scientific research, which is associated with the failure of imagination. This is a little bit like the story of the, uh, the parable of the drunk man who is looking for, uh, for his keys under the lamplight because that's where the light is, right? And there's this whole other area that where the keys could be, but he's not looking there because you, know, you can't see that. So how could this be? So the two ways that I'll, I'll mention wrapping up. One is the one is blind spots in research. So uh, here are a series of, uh, just a sample of topics that are really important in the world, extremely important in non grid populations, less, perhaps somewhat less important in grid populations. They are not studied by psychologists that much. And the reason for that is because we just don't have the people, we're not studying the people who are <coughs> these things matter. So kinship, for example, extremely important, but there's very little research on kinship in psychology as opposed to anthropology. Uh, study of food and eating. Uh, ethnicity as opposed to race. There's lots of research on race, very little on, on ethnicity, because most of the research is done in the United States where race is a problem, ethnicity is not so much of a problem. Uh, religion, same thing. Uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, research on religion, and whatever there is is mostly based on, uh, on Christianity as opposed to other religions. Belief in faith, for example, or belief in or, or the idea of holism, polygamy, ideas of purity, shame, honor, humiliation. These are all highly important topics that are overlooked by by uh, psychologists and behavioral scientists because the, the I think we think because of the kinds of populations that, that we've been studying. A second problem that uh, that the home field disadvantage creates is that it may lead, mislead us into over, having a too narrow understanding of, of the particular kind of phenomena that, we, that uh, we're studying. Um, uh, and so well, you saw the, 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 uh, lots of examples of that uh, in, in the previous uh, slides, but I'll give you two more examples that I think um, that 
that it may indicate that this problem actually can be generalized to other other areas of inquiry. It's not something unique to uh, the behavioral sciences. And this part is something that I've been thinking about very recently. So if you think this idea is too wacky, just blame it on me, don't blame it on Joel or Steve. So here's another interesting case. Again, it's a home field disadvantage case, right? So the paradigm case of the Industrial Revolution is, of course, England. England was the first country to industrialize. And guess who are the people who study the Industrial Revolution? Mostly Europeans. Before that, it was mostly English people or Anglo-Americans. So the, the, the key example that have been studied to that is England. Well, it turns out that actually there are many peculiarities of England as a, as a case study of the Industrial Revolution that may not generalize very well. Uh, so if you want to understand what causes what caused countries to industrialize? This is, of course, not an argument that only England industrialized. That's not true at all. The question is, we want to understand what factors mobilized countries to industrialize or not industrialize at a given point in time. And uh, it could be that actually, for a variety of reasons, England, the industrialization of England might be unique to England and may not generalize very well to other countries, like Germany or, or France, or even the second industrialized country, which was Belgium. Another example uh, that uh, that uh, could have, this could apply, and this is like I'm totally out of my field here, but I think I'm just speculating here. Could be an interesting thing to think about. Uh, is the search for extraterrestrial life, right? And and my the very little I know about this is that when astronomers and biologists are teaming up to look for life in in other planets, they're looking for the kind of life that you would expect exists in, on Earth, right? They're looking for carbon, abundance of carbon. So they're looking for planets where there's carbon, there are oceans for water, and then uh, they're looking for that Goldilocks zone, the sweet spot, not too hot, not too cold, right? That's, that's how our planet is. That's how our planet supports Earth. Now, there's recently, of course, uh, new evidence coming out that actually this, these assumptions may not be correct. So. Uh, you may not necessarily have to have carbon to have to have life. You might have you know, silicon might do it. Even uh, even methane. I just read recently that methane might be a plausible candidate for carbon based uh, for life as opposed to carbon. Recently, there was evidence uh, from California, the lake in California, that they found um, living bacteria that that feed on uh, ammonia instead of H2O. Right. So uh, when we don't broaden our our, our imagination to look at other possibilities that are familiar to us, we're overly limiting ourselves, and uh, and we're we're looking at the wrong places. Okay, so final slide. What can we do about all this? Uh, so here are a few a uh, few things, few suggestions that we came up with. Although I, we recognize this is a a bit of a challenging problem to 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 address for everyone. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, asking politicians to. Uh, impose term limits, limits on themselves, right? It's like, it's so, if you, if you buy this, if you're a behavioral scientist and you, you agree with this argument, you basically, the consequences are costly. You, we have to agree to do the research in a different way that's going to be costly to, to everyone. So it's, it's <coughs> exactly. here are some possibilities. I think the easiest, simplest thing we can do is uh, consciousness raising, just acknowledge that we have a problem. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, we're not even there yet. So, uh, so this, this is going to be the first thing. At the very minimum, for example, researchers who are publishing their papers on grid samples should at least acknowledge that you know, our samples are limited and we don't know how much this, we can generalize from this. So that, so that we, are, we are starting with, with uh, accepting that it is a problem. Beyond that, there are a number of uh, things that can be done to restructure the incentives of researchers so that they could be more adventurous and more uh, ambitious with generalizability issues. Uh, so for example, grant, granting agencies can demand from, uh, from researchers to demonstrate how they're going to generalize their, their, their findings to, to, to broader samples, not just the university students that they're studying. Journal editors can do the same thing. Even textbooks could use this as a criterion to include or exclude studies because textbooks have the, are in the, have the job of you know, deciding what's canonical knowledge in their fields. Beyond that, there are other things. So, so uh, use of technologies and different tools can be can be uh, useful. Uh, so, the use of the internet can be useful. Uh, just, 
the study of dead minds is a, is a, is a, could be an uh, interesting addition to the to the toolkits of the sciences. Uh, yeah, so that, uh, Ted Slingel is alive and well, and his brain is very well functioning. What I mean is that Ted Slingel is a proponent of the dead mind approach to to study people. So what I mean is that uh, we could access historical archival records. Uh, basically, the past is a different country, so we can go to the past and then look at, uh, and uh, to the extent that we can do meaningful uh, inferences from archives, archival evidence, uh, just in the way, same way that archaeologists do with, with material uh, artifacts. We might be able to also generalize our data, database that way. Uh, some have suggested the internet as a solution or partial solution because with the internet we can easily access samples from other uh, populations. The problem with that approach is that uh, even though I, I think it's a good idea, but it's incomplete because it's actually, here's the problem. Uh, we, we found, we did a little bit of research and we found that actually the very regions of the world that need to be represented the most are the, have the least internet penetration like Africa. Furthermore, to exacerbate the problem, whatever internet access there, there, there is in, the, in these non-weird countries, the, those people who have the internet access are the ones who are most feared than with their populations. So we're back to the same problem. Right? Still, it could be useful. I think the biggest uh, and most ambitious agenda that we can visualize and we could, we could hope for in the future is, is doing collaborative in the, in the disciplinary teams, and this would require a lot of restructuring of the way that academic departments work, the way universities fund research or grant agencies fund research, where you'd have teams of psychologists working with anthropologists who are familiar with different cultures, where there's an effort not only to do experiments in, with a lot of uh, experimental rigor, but also where there is an institutional setup where also generalizability issues are taken care of. That's it, thanks. So, uh, sure, yeah, so we have, there's time for questions. Um, I want to ask about the variability that exists in the data between these various uh, cultures. And you, Steve touched upon the idea that, um, especially with the IQ study, some is genetic, some is cultural. And I know the answer is always going to be both. But you get an idea whether some of the variability is more cultural or more genetic in terms of these different groups you're studying. You mean in terms of all the cultural areas? Yeah, all the cultures you're looking at, are these difference purely cultural differences, or are some of them Gene culture. Well, so, in, in our paper, we're, we're agnostic on that question. So, one of the things we did um, was we just referred to the population level variability. And that could be typical culturally transmitted differences where you acquire something by learning and growing up in a particular environment. It could be epigenetic differences where there are uh, certain triggers, environmental triggers that get passed down but not in DNA. There could be gene culture co evolutionary effects. It could be evoked cultural differences where something like um, pregnant or uh, pregnancy sickness, where you have to live in an environment that has certain kinds of uh, you have to eat meat, basically, you need certain kinds of vegetables, and then you have morning sickness, otherwise you don't have that in, in some populations. So there's all kinds of different sources of variation. I, I don't think we know mostly at this point. Do you have any guesses? It's going to lean one way or the other. Well, uh, I mean, I think lots of stuff is, is acquired by growing up in a particular environment, and learning, but I think the other possibilities we should want to take seriously. I mean, there's some sources of data that can address that for some questions, but looking at immigrants, they're a group that you know, um, share the same genes as those in their home country, but have cultural experiences in the environment. And so for many findings, immigrants fall in between the two other groups, suggesting that part of that would be cultural learning, but it's all of it, and it depends on the uh, One of the cases that we use in the paper a lot is the uh, case of IQ. Because we know that if we go back, this is work done by James Flynn, um, it, the, the mean IQ, if we scored it by, by today's standards, uh, in 1900 would be 70. So everyone would be, seem quite stupid back in 1900. Um, but so you've had this massive increase in IQ over the last century. 
So when you, you know, so that's a case where there could have been any genetic evolution at least too short a period of time for very much. Um, so it looks like some kind of culture cognition interaction. Yes. I have a question for uh, when you said that studying children is only a partial solution. Um, because cultural factors start really early, um, like how early, and is there a spectrum where um, the older the child and they immigrate to a different culture, um, I guess the less effect you see based on their cultural I mean, as soon as the baby is born, they they're exposed to cultures, right? So, so I think before, I even think before, I mean, even in the womb, it's right. I mean, even it says even before. So, so so for example, you know what? There's some work on bilingualism actually that shows that. Baby and babies in the womb and actually are already exposed to different sounds. Uh, in the world. So the, we don't know for sure, as far as I know, I, I, nobody knows for sure exactly if there is some kind of critical threshold, but I think that the problem exists uh, even in children, and of course the younger the baby is, probably the problem is less. So if I see evidence of, of, of some pro process very, very early on, that's encouraging that it could be innate. Uh, but it's not definitive proof. That's one issue. Uh, so it, without any cross-cultural comparison, I, I wouldn't just jump in the conclusion that we just it established could, it. In the, it could be culture. But it's very encouraging to sign that we did it exist early. The second issue we need to consider is that something could be innate very early, start very early, but then uh, cultural practices or environmental uh, influences could you know, modify those, those early, early um, uh, processes. So that's another reason why we need to give the adult data and those kind of things. Steve, you've done stuff on development on Windows, right? Yes, so um, uh, we're looking at uh, immigrants' culture into the environments, and we find that uh, up to the age of 14, immigrants seem to be able to uh, acculturate quite well. Uh, meaning, the longer, like the Hong Kong immigrants to Canada, the longer they're in Canada, the more they identify with Canada. After 15, the longer you're in Canada, doesn't impact how much identify. And after 30, the longer you're in Canada, the less you identify with Canada. And you seem to be rejected more the longer you're here. So I think that <laughs> suggests that. Uh, and that's, so we're wondering if that coincides roughly with puberty. So um, speculating that uh, that might be one thing that's reducing the, the, the sense of the window for cultural acquisition. Some of the um, uh, some of the work that Nathan Nunn presented in economics suggests that you know uh, cultures endure, and even generations later, you can still predict differences in economic behavior based on what's happening, what ha was happening in the mother country. Could it be like this, um, uh, I guess, cultural genetic confusion you're talking about, where there's some trace of second. Well, in, in the case of Nathan's stuff, it's clear that it's just cultural evolution, um, too slow for for gene cultural interaction. Yeah, I think Kylie wants to chime in here. Yeah. Um, well, just thinking about the, what early cultures we might have and, and things that are sort of equally biological and cultural gender, we didn't talk about gender very much in terms of um, any other example, um, which, you know, certainly different data suggests strong genetic <laughs> components of gender and uh, extremely strong cultural ones. In fact, when people talk about what's the earliest culture we have, it's the way we treat male versus female babies. Um, and so I'm just curious if you have any specific alpha gender and whether that should follow your weird thing. I kind of wanted you to say something about whether they were weird men or weird people or weird. Uh, I guess one thing on top of my head on this, I, I don't have a comprehensive answer, but one interesting uh, tip that I know is that if you look at the relative gender differences in math performance, which is kind of <coughs> math here, is that you know it's always like this, you know, boys are better than girls in math. If you look at cross culture data, you get wide variability, and there are some cultures where you don't have any difference. So these are all very novel questions that you can, if people are starting to ask, and we don't, and there's a lot of unanswered questions. I think it's important uh, to understand the sort of uh, interaction with ontogeny. So the one thing we do talk about in our paper, gender-wise, is, is uh, spatial abilities. So there, you know, at least in our society, there are these well-established male-female differences in spatial abilities. But there are some, so in, Inuit foraging groups don't seem to have any gender differences in spatial abilities. And then there's some there's research. Also the CS evidence. Right, right in Chicago. Um, uh, there, and there seems to be some effect of uh, the letting the boys roam around. So there seems to be sort of a motivation, experience-driven interaction. So if you let the boys do what they want, they rove around a lot more. As a consequence, they make better spatial maps.
But if you prevent the boys from roving around, then they don't make better spatial maps and, and you get the same <laughs> as girls. Yes? So right now in science studies, there's a really big trend towards looking at the way that the use of the word gene is being used in various cultures to replace other ways to describe the way that you came to be yourself. And it's very interesting. I noticed that in your talks, rarely, I don't think you mentioned the word gene once, but in the question, the word gene keeps coming up again and again and again. So I was wondering if you could voice the ways in which you navigate this landscape where we're trying to define what is human with this new terminology coming into play and being subsumed by the culture in which we live. Well, Steve, you're our gene essentialism expert. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to wrap my head around the question. Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, I think the way that uh, we think of this is that, yeah, people are born with a fairly uniform genome, some population variability that, that, that matters, and, uh, and then this is going to be expressed either through epigenetic inheritance or through evoked responses or through cultural transmission shaped in these ways. I mean, we, uh, I guess we don't talk about genes so much here in that um, the research that we're talking about really hasn't unpackaged the genes that are underlying these things. So at the cultural neuroscience talk last time here, that there was talk about some population variability in the serotonin transporter genes. So, so there, some of these genes do differ in their proportion around the world. Um, uh, curiously, some research is showing that those same alleles are expressed differently in different cultures, though, too. So even at the, the level of a, a single uh, genotype-phenotype relation, those, don't, those aren't necessarily constant, with the, with the few that have been mapped out and have been compared across cultures. But I think it's largely an open question. I think that um, more and more research is going to be looking at population variability in genes and how that might relate to uh, population variability in phenotypes. This is an excellent time for a plug, which is uh, our next seminar series next month is uh, Kevin Leland will be talking about gene culture coevolution. And among the things he'll be doing is he'll be reviewing the, the current evidence for gene culture interactions that are available in the human genome. Yes? Um, I thought a couple... I thought it was a good talk. A couple things. Um, I guess we can't be doing that bad if you can find that in cross cultural studies to compare. So I think that's good. But I think your point is well taken that the textbooks pick and choose what they use. That's what we're teaching our students. Obviously, there's lots of cross cultural research if you can access it. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely a place we have to work on. I found it weird that you use terribility as an example because it is defined as the proportion of variability. And so you're right, if you have a very small sample where you have very little variability, it's going to be an odd um, heritability quotient that you get, obviously. I teach my students that all the time. You can't base heritability judgments. You can't interpret it to say half my genes caused my IQ and half of my IQ is caused my culture. It's just, that's the common misunderstanding. Right. But, I, I would think it would be good if you could teach the rest of the field this, because I think that common I know, it's, it's exactly. That's why, why I think it's good to include it, even though I find it weird, because I come from a biology background, and we plan to understand that. But you're right, the rest of the field doesn't get it. So I understand exactly why you put it in there. But I think it's interesting to know at the end, um, when you're talking about the things that we don't commonly um, get into topics that we, as weird people, I guess most of us are, don't touch. It seems like a lot of them fall into what Charles talks about as more or less moralistic fallacy. So things that we think should be the way they are. So cultures, races shouldn't, ethnicities shouldn't be different, or the sexes shouldn't be different, or we shouldn't be um, uh, spiteful. Or, you know, there's a lot of things where we don't want to touch because it, there shouldn't be differences between ethnicities in IQ, or there shouldn't be differences. And it seems like there's a lot of political correctness <coughs> around what we study right now. And we're not getting into the areas that we might if we weren't as politically correct. Mm -hmm. I should say that that list was is also characterized a lot of what we studied in our lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had thought of it. That's an interesting point about, about why, you know, another interesting take on why these topics are not central to psychology or to science. I mean, my, my, you know, my sense is that a lot of these things are just not in the, not in the you know, uh, radar zone of psychology. It doesn't occur to them that kinship is really important. We need to understand that, you know, how people, we study relationships. It's all ephemeral relationships of like, you know, 
uh, family friendships or family romantic relationships. Yeah. Okay. I don't know any difference in psychology about sibling relationships. Yeah. Or but parents, as you say, in other, in other areas, kinship is really important in that. Well, in anthropology, it's centrally important. Yeah. So it doesn't occur to me that there's any taboo on studying But in our culture, it's not right to say that you hired someone because they're your brother or sister. In our culture, kinship is kind of. Because of we're not supposed to make decisions based on that. We're not supposed to really pay, like it's not as big of a, a thing as in other cultures where a lot of their decisions are based on which that is okay. Um, so I wonder whether one thing you guys didn't mention is a possible solution. Um, whether kind of encouraging people to focus on mechanisms. Would help. And it wouldn't work for all of the findings you have by any means, but in a lot of cases, once you explain why were weird on this domain, it all made sense. And had the researcher originally, and we were not as a great example, they had they were, and I guess they did originally say, oh, it's because of buildings. If they then said, oh, wait, not everyone has buildings, um, they would have then said, hey, let's do a cross cultural study. And so I wonder if in a lot of cases, one of the problems, at least in social psychology, might be, hey, let's get a cool finding without studying the mediator. And if actually they look, people look more for the mediator and the mechanism, we can think, oh wait, that's not something that generalizes everyone, so therefore we should. Or the other way, right? Oftentimes right. the cross culture data points to the possible For sure, for sure, exactly. Yeah, that's the perfect mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Yeah. I do think thinking about ontogenetic processes, so what are the, how does the developmental system bootstrap these things up, and then you can begin to see how the environment or the cultural beliefs are going to reshape that in different directions. 